Okay, so I'm slightly scared because I clicked on the Flock Live program and then I saw that, okay, the first speaker there was me. So, um, uh, okay, well, I'm, I'm happy to be the first speaker in Flock. Um, so I should say that, uh, so this, this is a, a course in computational learning theory. I'm not a learning theorist, so I'm coming at this from the side of logic. So I work in logic and verification. So if you're in core learning theory, you may find this presentation slightly idiosyncratic, but I, I want to uh, emphasize the connections with uh, logic and verification. Okay, so if you have been living under a rock in the last 10 years, you may not have heard of this thing called machine learning, but um, you know, it's well known now, and the, the kind of guiding idea is to have a computer solve problems by learning from data rather than being explicitly programmed. So if you have lots of data, and if your task is hard to explicitly program, then maybe machine learning is, is the thing for you. And there are kind of headline successes. So one such, su su such success is the um, ability to predict uh, how people will rate movies based on their past ratings. And sometimes without even knowing any, without even having any semantic tagging of what kind of movie uh, uh, um, a, a given uh, film is about. Another notable success is in game playing. So machine learning systems are at the level of the most advanced dedicated uh, chess engines. And, you know, the, and the machine learning systems have been trained either on databases of uh, chess games or even by uh, self-play. So those are the kind of ripped from the headlines kind of successes of machine learning. In this talk, it, I'm going to be really, really specific. I'm going to focus on a very, very narrow uh, subset of machine learning. So, but I'd just like to start by just surveying some of the areas, and I guess you'll see some of them this week. So what we'll be interested in in this talk is just classification. So this is the problem where you've got a bunch of data items and you want to assign them to a class. So you might have a bunch of newspaper articles and you might want to say, is this an article about events, sports, politics, entertainment, business, or, or, or else? Just by looking at the article, maybe counting the, the number of occurrences of certain words. So something we'll not talk about is regression, where you want to predict a, a numerical value for each data item rather than a discrete class, a, a numerical uh, uh, value like the price of a stock. So we'll say nothing about that. We'll say nothing about clustering. So um, you've got some, so this is kind of unsupervised learning. You've got uh, a bunch of uh, uh, data items, maybe users in a social network, and you want to group them together in natural ways. So nothing about that, and nothing also about ranking. So uh, ordering results of a search query by relevance to a particular user, as an example. So this talk, classification all the way, and this is kind of natural in logic, because what is a formula therefore to classify some, some, some uh, elements as true or false? Okay, so um, the title of the talk is uh, Learning Theory. So you've got these kind of very sexy applications of machine learning, and underneath you've got these uh, learning theorists, and, uh, and what are they doing? Well. Ideally, the goal of learning theory is to help us kind of analyze formal, well, develop formal models, analyze them, and, and provide some kind of guarantees for the machine learning algorithms. So, you know, what can we hope to learn efficiently? How much data do we, do we need? And how much computational power do we need to, to uh, achieve the kind of goals that we want in machine learning? And it's great if we can do things, but it's even better if we have some kind of guarantees that our, our learning algorithm uh, on the performance of our learning uh, algorithm, and also to understand you know, which algorithms to deploy in, in which situation. So as I say, I mean, this is a kind of general series set of goals for, for learning theory, but what I'm particularly concerned with is connections with logic and verification. Okay, so just a, a quick overview of this mini course. So I have three hours. I'm gonna, I think probably one and a half hours is a bit of a stretch for continuous lecture, so I'll probably break in the middle uh, briefly. Um, but what is the overview? So I'm really going to focus very narrowly on this classical probably pack learning model, pr probably approximately correct. So this is, goes back to Valiant in the 80s. I want to talk about VC dimension. 
uh, as a characterization of packed learnability. And I'll give some examples, uh, particularly in connection with logic, logical formulas, and say with applications to, to computing VC dimension of neural nets. I want to present this classic kind of fundamental result that finite VC dimension is equivalent to packed learnability. So this is a characterization of learnable classes. So this is all very fundamental and classical. One thing that's maybe a little bit more closer to the um, frontiers of research is I want to talk about sample compression schemes and the littleston warmoth con conjecture. So this is a, another characterization of packed learnability and with very nice connections with, to, to logic. And well, I want to talk about concept classes that are hard to learn. Time permitting means there won't be any time, so I'm pretty sure I'll have no time for that. And uh, lastly, I want to talk about learning with membership queries. So, so particularly learning automata, which is, I think, a thing where in verification, um, it, it seems to be of particular interest in verification, this uh, Ang Anguin uh, model of learning with automata. So I should also say that um, I have LaTeX lecture notes for this uh, course. They're not actually online yet, because as I was preparing my, my handwritten lecture notes, I saw some howlers that need to be uh, fixed. But um, either today or tomorrow, I'll, I'll, um, I'll distribute these. So I'll put them on the web. OK, so uh, let me begin by talking about the PAC model. So, uh, so a learning problem is in this model is specified by an input space, x, and a concept class, which is a class of functions from x to 0, 1. So as I said, we're looking just at classification. And here, even more simply, we want to classify things as 0 or 1. So I'll give an example in a second. That's a problem. An instance of a problem is determined by an unknown distribution on the input space and a target concept. So the target concept is what we're trying to learn. And the distribution is governing the uh, distribution on examples that we can draw. So the idea is to, to learn this target concept. What we're going to do is we're going to draw a training sample of size m. So s is a sequence of elements from the input set of size m. And we, draw, and we take these uh, independently, identically distributed from, m, uh, from d. And uh, so our target is seen. What, we, what the output of the learning algorithm is is a hypothesis. So the hypothesis is a function from the input space to 0, 1. And what is our goal? Our goal is it should be approximately correct. So we define the error of our hypothesis as the probability, if I draw an input from D, that the hypothesis misclassifies the input uh, relative to the target. And we want that that error be small. That's our goal. So. Um, this is the basic setup of the, the PAC model. So here's a, 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 an example, so spam filtering. So this is classi a classification problem. You have an email, either it's spam or it's not spam. So it's a 0, 1 classif classification problem. Here, here are three example emails with their, their classification. So there is a target function. So the target function is this ideal platonic judgment about whether an, uh, uh, an email is spam or not. And here, the first one is not spam. Uh, I think this was a real email, actually. Uh, I think they're all real emails, actually. Yeah. So from my inbox back in the day. Uh, this one's not spam. This is spam. And this is the one. So we, we, some, somehow the first two are our training examples. And we want to classify the third uh, email. Is it spam or not? So that's our, our, our um, uh, task. So as a, if we want to encode this as a learning problem, how are we going to do this? So an email is, is a body of text. But one thing we might. Um, do is identify some features of the email and try and judge whether or not it's spam based on these features. So the features, the features could be whether it has bad spelling, yes or no. Does it come with an attachment? Does it contain my name, Ben? So, so only people who know me well would know to call me Ben. Does it contain the word Viagra? And then there's the, the, the judgment, is it spam or not? So in the context of the model I was just presenting to you, there's an input space, which is the space of features. So here it's 0, 1 to the 4. So every uh, email is represented as a 4 tuple, and that's my input. And then I have to judge based on that, is it spam or not? So the concept class here is part of the learning problem. I have to tell you what it is. So what are the rules that I'm going to use to judge whether or not an email is spam? So um, I'm going to choose the concept class here of so-called linear classifiers. 
So here's a linear classifier. Um, it's a weighted combination of these feature vectors. So if it has a bad spelling, then I give it weight 2. If it contains uh, my name, then I give it weight minus 3. And if it contains Viagra, I give it weight 1. And then I ask, if it exceeds the threshold 2, then it's spam. So that's a linear classifier. And the concept class here, C, is the class of all linear classifiers. So um, what I want is, so my, my idea is that the target uh, here is a linear classifier that I want to learn. So let's say formally what the, uh, uh, well, I should say here that, okay, so in, in this, in, in this uh, example, there's a distribution on emails. That's the distribution of nature. And um, I want to learn a linear classifier that's going to classify future emails. So from this data here, I want to learn a linear classifier that's going to class classify any new e emails I receive as to whether or not they're spam. So let me formally define the model, the PAC model. So we're given a target concept that we want to learn, and it's in our concept class, which is uh, 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 part of a, a learning problem. And I'm going to introduce some notations. So LCM is going to be the, the collection of labeled samples. So, so this is the, the data I draw is, are, are going to be labeled samples. So S here is a set of inputs. And S comes uh, um, uh, equipped with the label. So uh, the target concept is used to label the input. So I've, I've got a bunch of emails, and they're labeled according to the target concept. Are they spam or not? And that's what I want to learn from. So we say that the concept class C is pack learnable with sample complexity M, accuracy epsilon, and confidence delta if there is a learning map such that. So what does this learning map do? It takes as input a sample of size M from the input space. So um, the input looks like this. So the input to the learning map. So let S So here's a set of emails that I've just received. And each email is represented as a feature vector. So this is one email, second email. And they're labeled according, for training, they're labeled according to the target concept. So the tar uh, they're labeled according to whether they're um, spam or not. So that's my training data. And I say that this, this, if this class is uh, packed learnable, there's a function that uh, operates on this training data and gives me a classification function as output. So what I'm learning is this classification function. And what do I want from this? OK, so for any target concept, so this learning function is, is monolithic. For every, every uh, target concept, I want, um, so this is a mouthful, the probability over my training data. So my training data is uh, um, a set of uh, emails of size m, a sample set of size m. So s is distributed. Uh, from D to the M. And I want the probability that the error of the learned hypothesis, so here is the learned hypothesis, so the learning map applied to the training data. I want that this error be less than or equal to epsilon, and I want that the probability of this happening um, uh, be uh, at least 1 minus delta. So there are two parameters here, delta and epsilon. So delta is the, the um, confidence. So the idea is that one... If my training set is very uh, unrepresentative of the true distribution, then I'm never going to learn. I, my learning function is going to be useless. And this is the delta here. OK, but if the training set is good, then I can learn a function with error less than epsilon. So are there any questions at this stage? So this is a complex definition. Yeah. Aha, uh -huh. OK, good question. So uh, it's a probability distribution on uh, the inputs, uh, input space here. So, uh, and let's assume that the in input space is discrete. So I'm assigning a probability to every element. OK, so it's a, uh, a helpful question. I'm assigning a, a probability to every element such that it, it, it adds up to 1. So in general, of course, I, I, I'll be considering input spaces that are uh, Rn and, yeah. Ah. So, sorry for interrupting. Uh, there, there is a Slack channel that people can sign up for if you put questions in there during the talk. I'll collect them for 
Aha. Okay. So I have I have some questions in the talk, but um, I'll I'll answer I'll self answer. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, let me then continue. Okay. So remarks on this definition. So first of all, in terms of learning theory, this is very this is very idealistic. So I'm assuming we're trying to learn a target concept. So out there, there's a target concept we're trying to learn. So of course, if you're doing real learning. It's not the you're trying to learn whether an image is an image of a cat or not. I mean, there's no perfect answer to that question. There's no target concept. And for sure, that target concept, if there is one, it's not a linear classifier or even a neural net of a certain depth and with a certain number of neurons. So what this means in learning theory jargon is we're working in the realizable setting rather than the agnostic setting. So it's like we're trying to interpolate from a known class of functions. So this is somehow mathematically quite nice, but slightly unrealistic. And as a consequence of the fact we're working in this realizable setting, there are a whole host of issues that I'm, I won't say anything about. So for instance, model selection. So the first thing you do when you have a learning problem is you think, well, what are the class of functions I'm going to use to try and, and, and do this, solve this problem? Am I, am I going to use support vector machines? Am I going to use neural nets? And here, uh, we're assuming there's a, a concept class is given. So, um, and so there's a whole bunch of issues that we gloss over. So I want to emphasize this, de this definition of packed learnability is very strong. It says it's essentially that uh, for learning a concept class, and I'll give another example in a second, I want to be able to learn it with a given number of, of um, examples which only depends on this accuracy, epsilon, and confidence delta, but is independent of the d probability distribution on the examples. So it may be that actually, if I knew the distribution, then I could, you know, I could do better, and this model is too uh, pessimistic. The next point is the definition allows for improper uh, learning. So the definition I gave said nothing about the form or representation of the hypothesis. So I've got a target class of concepts that I'm trying to learn, say linear classifiers, but I allow the learner to output a function in any representation at all. And the second thing is pack learning. So I've heard one criticism say that pack learning describes uh, an undergraduate who's, who's trying to learn for ex an exam by looking at past papers. So the undergraduate maybe is not trying to understand the core concepts of physics, it's just trying to predict what's going to come up on the next exam and, and get the right answer. So um, as kind of formulated there, PAC makes learning seem like a, a problem of pre prediction. But as we'll see from the, the, the work on sample com compression schemes, there are kind of equivalent characterizations which correspond to our idea of learning as a kind of form of, um, of compression. Uh, but as it's formulated, there's no kind of appearance of Occam's razor, say. Okay, so that, because the definition is a bit of a mouthful, I want to give another example. And this is like the classic example of packed learnability. So here, a learning problem, I said there's a, a, there's a concept class. So here, what is the concept class? Well, there's an input space. So here the input space is R2. So these are the, 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 the inputs to the learning problem. And the concepts here is a collection of functions from R2 to 0, 1, such that uh, f is the characteristic function of a rectangle. OK, so. So these are my concepts. My concepts are rectangles, so they're geometric concepts. And the, and the red and blue dots here is sort of a training sample that I've drawn. So I had a distribution, fixed and unknown. So I don't know this distribution, but I'm drawing from this distribution. D is a distribution on R2. And I draw some training examples. And this rectangle R here is the target. This is the thing I'm trying to learn. I, don't know, I, can't, I can see this rectangle here, but uh, this is unknown, and I'm trying to learn it. The training samples are labeled according to the target. So all I can see is this training set of blue and red dots. That's all I can see as a learner. And I'm trying to figure out what is the rectangle that I'm trying to learn. So here's one 
uh, kind of procedure I could, I could take is I could say, well, let me look at the blue dots, which I know are marked as being inside the rectangle, and let me take the smallest rectangle that includes all the blue dots. So as a learner, that's going to be my hypothesis. So this is the rectangle RS here. And what I want to uh, say is that this procedure here, if I take enough, if my sample is big enough, I'm going to get an accurate hypothesis um, with high probability over the sample. So this is what I, I want to give you a, 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 now a, a brief argument that what I've just described here is, is a packed learning function for a large enough sample. So let's um, uh, look at, uh, so this is our target rectangle that we want to learn. And let's mark off some uh, regions, which I'm going to call border regions, such that their probability, so the probability here is the, uh, the probability of a point landing in the, the rectangle under this distribution here. So for instance, E1 is such that the probability of a point landing in this rectangle is epsilon over 4. So epsilon here is the uh, accuracy of, that I want my hypothesis to have. So this is my target ac accuracy, and I want to say how many samples do I need to achieve this accuracy. So I mark off these four border regions um, of my target rectangle with mass epsilon over 4. If my target rectangle doesn't have mass epsilon, at least epsilon over 4, I won't be able to do this, but uh, in this case I, I need not worry. I'll have, output the empty hypothesis. Okay, so these, re these regions exist if the, the measure is absolutely continuous. And um, here's the question. Given epsilon greater than zero and delta greater than zero, how many samples are needed such that the error of my hypothesis rectangle, so my hypothesis is RS, this was the smallest rectangle that enclosed all the blue dots, all the, the, the positively labeled examples. So how many samples are needed such that this error rectangle has uh, area less than epsilon with probability at least one minus delta? So this probability here, let me emphasize, is the probability over the random sample S. So I draw a random sample, and um, I, I, want, I want this. And the idea is as follows. Um, I mean, what could go wrong in, in my learning? Oops. Uh, what could go wrong? Um, it's clear. That's... Uh... Sorry. Oh. Okay. That's, that's going to work. Yeah. Okay. Maybe actually when I turn again magically it will be clean. We'll see. Um, yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. that's, that's what I call learning. Um, that's generalization. Okay. Let's try this. This is optimism. Um, okay. I'm trying to learn. Uh, so, well. I've drawn some samples, and I've observed that these guys are positively labeled, and these guys are negatively labeled. And I think, ah, well, the hypothesis rectangle I, I'm, I'm going to learn is this one. So it's the smallest one that contains all the samples. Um, uh, but it turns out I was unlucky, because in fact, the true target was like this. This is actually the, the com target concept. It was just I was unlucky that the sample didn't, didn't contain any points here which would tell me to expand my hypothesis. So I want to, I want to upper bound this, this probability. So the error of my hypothesis is, so if my hypothesis were here and the target were here, the error is the, is the area of this under the distribution D. The probability that a random point lands in here. So this is my error. And I'm OK just as long. So my error is the probability of the, 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 the target minus the hypothesis. So the hypothesis is always inside the target. And um, I'm OK just as long as my uh, sample hits all four border regions. Um, so if I go back to this picture here, imagine my sample. I see a, when I'm drawing my sample, I see a point in here, in E1, in E2, in E3, in E4 then my hypothesis will be uh, expanded to hit all four border regions, and the gap between my hypothesis and the target will have area less than epsilon over four. So I'll be okay if I hit all four border regions. So the question is, how many samples do I need 
uh, to hit all four border regions with probability at least uh, 1 minus delta. So here, let me draw the border regions here. So the idea is that if I have a sample, if I see a plus positive point here, a positive point here, a positive point here, a positive point here, then my hypothesis rectangle will be big enough so that the gap between it and the true, uh, uh, the true target concept is less than epsilon. So uh, the bad event that I want to, to, to avoid is that my sample points, none of them hits, uh, 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 well, one of the border regions is missed by, by my sample points. So, the prob so I'm going to draw M samples. The probability that all M samples miss the border region E1, which had uh, mass epsilon over 4, is then 1 minus epsilon over 4 to the M. And here we can just use the, the most useful inequality that you'll ever come across. We'll use that. So this is less than e to the minus epsilon m over 4. So the probability that some border region, e1, e2, e3, and e4, is missed by all m samples is 4 times that. That's just a union bound. So the probability of a or b is less than or equal to the probability of a plus b. And then the question is, how many samples do I need? So what do I want? This is an estimate on the probability of the bad event. My sample doesn't fill the target rectangle enough, so I don't make my hypothesis big enough. Um, so, and I want this to be less than delta. And to get, for this to be true, I want my sample size to be at least 4 over epsilon log 4 over delta. So this is a, a, a quantity you'll see in, 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 uh, in these generalization bounds. So my sample, this is, uh, well, here's a sanity check. My sample should, the sample size should depend on epsilon and delta. So epsilon is the accuracy of my hypothesis, and delta is the confidence uh, that, you know, so delta, uh, uh, delta is the, uh, the probability that my learning uh, um, procedure fails completely because I draw a, a bad sample. But it, as, if my sample is big enough, then I'm okay. And this, this is distribution independent. I didn't assume anything about the distribution. So, uh, what this proves is that the class, so the concept, so what have we proved? We've proved that the concept class of rectangles in R2, so axis-aligned rectangles, is pack-learnable. It admits a, a learning map, so let's just be very explicit about that. Um, what is the learning map? So again, uh, there exists, um, so for, for every epsilon, given epsilon and delta, there exists an M, and a learning map H that takes labeled samples according to M and returns a function. So here, the learning map is actually, whoops, is actually going to return a rectangle. So it's a so-called proper learning map, such that the probability um, over a sample that the, the, the error of H, um, well, let me just, just write it. Uh, okay. So probability over samples that if I apply the learning map to this uh, sample um, labeled by the target concept, uh, the probability that the... Ah. Okay. My hand is going to get very blue by the end of this. Uh, the probability that the error of this is greater at epsilon is less than delta. So the probability over samples that my hypothesis has a bad error is less than delta. OK, so a finite sample suffices, uh, and the, uh, the size of the sample is polynomial in 1 over epsilon and 1 over delta. And what is the learning map? It's just output the smallest consistent hypothesis. So you're given this labeled sample. There is, there's, there is a consistent hypothesis. There's a, a smallest rectangle that contains all the positive examples, and that's the learning map. Uh, so I'm re uh, really not allowed to answer, ask any questions. Is this, uh, I, can ask and I can ask and answer. I can ask my... Aha, uh -huh. I see. Uh, permitted rhetorical questions. Okay. <laughs> I'm permitted rhetorical questions. Like, what, what am I doing here on a fine <laughs> Sunday morning? Um, okay. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. 
Okay, sounds good. Uh, any questions that you would like me to repeat and then try and answer? Uh, okay, so, um, yeah. Okay, so this, this is, uh, there's a lot of quanti quantifiers in the definition, but, um, so, um, you've seen, at least if, if this lecture is the only part of learning theory you've seen, you've seen now one hypothesis class. That is the class of rectangles in the plane. So in general, uh, well, let's think of uh, uh, something, uh, a more expressive hy hypothesis class. So uh, there's the so-called perceptron, so, or, or, or less colorfully, a linear classifier. So a linear classifier is a function from Rn to minus 1 plus 1, uh, given as follows. So uh, f maps to plus 1, so there's a, there's a given vector a and a constant b. f maps to plus 1 if ax is greater or equal to b and minus 1 otherwise. So if you're viewing this as a set, it's a half, a half space in, the, in, in, in Rn. So f is saying, well, you map to plus 1 if you're one side of this uh, hyperplane and minus 1 if you're another side of the hyperplane with normal uh, a. And um, so given such a classifier, suppose I give you a, a, a set of um, uh, labeled data. So I give you, um, let me have a, maybe I'm going to use this. This one? Oh, okay. Oh, you're right. Okay. It was the pen. So, um, yeah. So, I, I'm giving them a bunch of points in the plane. So, I'm given, so this set here is a bunch of vectors labeled with plus or minus one. And now, now let's say we're in the plane. And I want to know, is this consistent with some linear classifier? So is there a linear classifier that is actually consistent with this? Well, in this case, there is. So if I take this, this, this line that separates them, then the, the, the linear classifier that says assign plus 1 to everything this side of the hyperplane and, and minus 1 uh, minus to the other side is, 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 is consistent with that. And you can formulate the, so given such a point, you can, uh, given such a set, you can formulate the exist, deciding the existence of such a classifier as a linear program. Okay, so one important part of learning a, a, a problem is, is finding a consi consistent classifier. So in the case of the rectangles, what, we found a consistent classifier very easily by, by taking the smallest rectangle that contained all the positive points. It's not much harder, uh, so in, in the concept class of um, rectangles, it was very easy to find consistent classifiers. It's not much harder in this case, right, uh, for, for linear classifiers. Um, okay, so if a consistent linear class classifier exists, then we say that S is linear separable. But, um, um, here's, but of course, this is a very kind of inexpressive uh, um, class of classifiers. So, um, but they can be combined into so-called neural nets, and, and what's the idea here is, well, uh, we want to combine perceptrons. So, given a set of points in, in Rd, and let's say an arbitrary function from s to minus 1, how can we realize, so this should be capital F, as a composition of percept perceptrons? So, here's the situation. I... Um, so perceptrons are somehow not expressive enough for what uh, we want to do. So uh, let's take, again in the plane, uh, a set of points, and they're labeled positively and negatively, like this. And I want to build a classifier, and I'm going to build a classifier, as I've said, as a combination of perceptrons. And what do I mean by this? I mean as, uh, as follows, that... Um, I want to take my input, I want to feed it to some perceptrons, and I want to feed these perceptrons as in input to another perceptron, and I want the output to give me the classification. Okay? And, well, here's one thing I can do. So I can say, take this positive point, and say, well, there's a half space here 
and a half space here. So um, if I say that this point is, this point is uniquely um, distinguished from all the others by saying it's on this side of this half space and it's on that side of that half space. So if I have, I can, let, me, let the linear classifier here be F and this be G. We'll call this point X here, X1, let's say. Then X1, F at X1 plus uh, G of X1. So this linear classifier gives one for this point because it's on the right side of the, the hyperplane. This one gives one for this point because it's on the right side of the hyperplane. So this is equal to two. So if I do this, then this is minus one plus this. So this function on x1, or let me just say this is a function of x, this function here uh, on this point gives one, but on all the other points uh, gives um, uh, minus one, so on all other points. So if I then take the, the sign of this, this is going to be plus one here and minus one on all the other points. Okay, so um, uh, by combining uh, classifiers like this, I can realize any, um, uh, uh, well, so actually, uh, yeah. So, I can, so here's, here's the function that's going to realize big F. So um, in fact, what I'm doing is I'm taking all the points that, are posit that I want to be positively labeled. So for each point, I pick a linear classifier uh, like, uh, so this would be, uh, this here, well, this is the F and G classify the, the, the hyperplanes. So I, I include each point between two hyperplanes and have classifiers for each side. So this is to the left and to the right. And then this thing picks out, uniquely gives plus one for the point that I'm interested in, Xi, and, and minus one for all other points. And then I take the sign. So what it, so what it's saying in, 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 in jargon is that, well, this is defining a neural net. So these, these, uh, there are linear classifiers in this um, uh, intermediate level, which are uh, these guys. So there's one hidden, so-called hidden layer. And there's the output, which is the value h, and the inputs, which are these xi. So by combining perceptrons in a graph like this, I can realize uh, this arbitrary function on a finite set. And in fact, you can realize any continuous function on a compact set can be realized uh, up to any accuracy by a neural net with um, uh, uh, one hidden layer. So, what, so more formally, what is a neural net? So it's a directed, acyclic layered graph with inputs in Rn and an output in 0, 1. So um, here's the picture. Um, there are some input nodes uh, and some uh, intermediate nodes. And um, each node in the net is computing a function. And this function is something like a linear classifier. So, um, uh, uh, so for each node, there are several inputs. So here are the inputs. And um, there's, so there's a weight. So for instance, this node, it has two inputs. And there's a weight assigned to each input. And to compute the value of this node, I take the, the inputs and I sum them according to these weights. I have a kind of threshold here, W0, which is another parameter I associate with this uh, node. And then I apply sigma, so-called activation function. So for linear classifiers, this is the sign function. You just say, is this, is this positive or negative? But you can choose other activation functions. And that gives you the output of this node, and that therefore the, node, uh, the, the net computes a function. And uh, so what I described before, the, the output was a, uh, the activation function was a step function, just return one if the thing is positive and zero otherwise, or minus one otherwise. Now in, uh, in some sense, this is not really used because the nets are hard to train with this uh, step function. If you have an activation function which um, uh, is differentiable, then you can train the, the, the nets by gradient descent. So uh, this, this is uh, preferred. But OK, so uh, here's a, an expressive class of, of concepts that you might try and learn. OK? And the question is, well, how many examples would you need to train a, a neural net? 
So there are two really, there, well, there are two issues. There are, you know, how many examples do you need, and what's the computational complexity of finding a consistent classifier? So back in the world of rectangles, finding a con consistent classifier was completely trivial. Now, it's clear that if, if, if I give you a bunch of positively labeled and negatively la labeled examples and say, here's a neural net, so I present you a graph, and I say, find a consistent classifier, what are you going to do? You're, you're going to try and find the weights of the neural net that make it classify the positive and negative examples exactly, then this uh, is a difficult problem. So the following problem is NP-hard. So you're given a feed-forward neural network. So this is just the graph with D inputs and a single hidden layer with three neurons. So here's the, here's the, the situation. You've got D inputs. And this hidden layer is... is um, three neurons here, so it's, it's fully connected here. And uh, what you have to do to train it is choose the weights. So choose the weights of all these edges and the threshold weights of the three neurons. And here's the, here's the, the, the consistency problem, computational problem. Is there some weight setting that is consistent with a given labeled sample? So I, I've got my input points and I want you know, to label this one minus, this one plus. So this is NP-hard. Um, but, um, I mean, this is with the step activation function. If you have, um, you know, but as, as you know, if you have, uh, you know, ReLU activation function or sigmoidal ac activation function, then in practice, neural nets can be, be, be trained. Um, okay, so um, let me just kind of wrap up, you know, what have, I, what have I tried to do is I've set up the basic PAP model is that there are concept classes that we try and learn. So we have a concept class C, and the question we can ask is, is this pack learnable or not? And for the only thing we've seen so far is the rectangles in the plane are pack learnable. And, um, I've, and I said, well, rectangles were a boring uh, concept class, so let's talk about neural nets. So I didn't say uh, talk about pack learnability there, but I just said, well, I mean, one thing, one obvious way to, to show pack learnability is to draw a sample and find a consistent hypothesis. Well, okay, so um, uh, uh, we've seen that finding consistent hypotheses is, is computationally hard for rectangles, uh, for, for neural nets. But let, let me just say that my, my, the definition of pack learning I, I gave, um, if I just go back, so let me ask a rhetorical question. Uh, you gave a definition of pack learn learnability, but it said nothing whatsoever about computational complexity. Uh, so I say that the concept class C is pack learnable with sample complexity M, accuracy epsilon, and confidence delta if there is a learning map such the probability if I draw a sample of size M that the learning map when eating the sample returns a hypothesis of error less than epsilon, the good case, this probability is greater than 1 minus delta. So I said nothing about the complexity of executing that map. I didn't even say anything about the representability of the output of the map. So this definition I, I gave just talked about um, sample complexity. And um, so I, I won't talk about computational complexity for a, a little while. OK, so um, maybe a chance for a question that could be repeated. OK. No. Okay, so um, I want now to, I mean, you, you're given a concept class, and the question is, is it pat learnable or not? Yes or no? And um, there is a combinatorial um, uh, measure which will tell you, uh, which, which characterizes when a class is pat learnable. And this is VC dimension, so this is very clean and nice. So let C be a comp concept class on input space X, such as our rectangles, and we say that, that S is shattered by C if every function from S to 0, 1 arises as the restriction of some uh, uh, concept C in C. So um, here is an example. Uh, so let's take the input space R2, and here's a set of four points in R2, and let me ask, is this set shattered by, so let C be rectangles in the plane, 
Is this set shuttered by rectangles in the plane here? So here's the set. So every function from the set to 0, 1, I mean every labeling, every labeling of positive and negative, uh, it, it arises as the, the labeling can be realized by some concept. So is this set here shuttered by rectangles in the plane? So only answer if you don't know the answer. It's cheating if you do know the answer. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah. So this labeling is not realized because if I want a rectangle that realizes this labeling, I, the rectangle has to include these points. So it has the smallest rectangle that includes these four points is this. But then I'm forced to include this point. So this is not shuttered. However, if I put this point outside, well, I could realize this labeling. And, I, and with these four points, I could realize any labeling. So um, for instance, if you wanted a labeling so I claim these four points are shattered. So if I wanted a labeling where this is minus, this is plus, and this is plus, I could put a rectangle like this. OK, so that's shattered. OK, and I and claim any, any, so to be shattered means that any labeling can be realized. And the VC dimension, so this is a, a, the dimension of the concept class, is defined as the supremum over, of the sizes of all finite sh sets that are shattered by the concept class. So what can, we, what can we, from this definition, what can we infer about the VC dimension of this class? So I claim that this four element set is shattered. So this tells me that the VC dimension is at least four. Okay, maybe I can shatter a five element set. Well, can I shatter a five element set? So is there a five element set that I can shatter with the rectangles? Yeah, OK. <laughs> OK, but, uh, can, I, can I shatter a five element set uh, with the concept class of axis aligned rectangles? Uh, which you're, now you'll tell me the answer. No, yeah. OK, because I mean, if I've got five elements, then there's one element's going to be the, have the highest y coordinate, one will have the least y coordinate, one will have the, 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 the smallest x coordinate, one will have the greatest. And the other one will have to be in the small, and these extremal guys will have to contain, the rectangle that, in, that contains these extremal guys will have to contain the fifth point, and therefore the, 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 the labeling where these guys are all negative and this fifth point is positive is unrealizable. So for any set of five points, there is an unrealizable uh, labeling. So, so okay. So, um, uh, what this tells us is that the, this third example here, axis-aligned rectangles, the VC dimension is 4. Uh, what about triangles? So uh, let's go to the fourth thing, uh, convex k-guns. What's the VC dimension of triangles in the plane? Um, I mean, you know, what's the largest set that I can shatter with triangles in the plane? Um, I, it's a workout. I can shatter three. I can do, well... Uh, certainly I can shatter three. Well, here are four points. Um, okay, well, that's, that's, I claim I can shatter seven points. So here are seven, here's a set of seven points. I need to, uh, hold on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I want to realize any labeling. So here's a labeling. So here's a labeling where I've only got three positive points. Then clearly I can realize that with this triangle. And you might say, ah, but what if you only have, what, what if you have um, uh, four positive points, the same set? So let's say, uh, so how can I realize this? Well, I can kind of realize that by cutting off the negative points like that. Okay. Okay, so... Um, uh, in, in this case, it's actually, so the, the VC dimension of convex kagons is 7. Um, can, I, well, can I ask the VC dimension of Boolean formulas on input space 0, 1? So what is the largest subset of 0, 1, n that can be shattered by the concept class of Boolean formulas? So I wanted to take a subset of 0, 1 to the n and realize all labelings of that subset 
by a Boolean formula. So here's S subset of 0, 1 to the N. I want to shatter S, so every, every way of labeling S with, with 0, 1, I want to be realized by a Boolean formula. Yeah? Yeah, in fact, I can shatter the whole thing, because any function from 0, 1 to the N to uh, 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 0, 1 can be realized by a Boolean formula. So the VC dimension is 2 to the N. But if I restrict to a Boolean a circuit, let's say, with N cubed gates, uh, well, can I realize every function uh, from 0, 1 to the N to 0, 1? So, what it, so any guesses on the VC dimension here? What's the largest set? I mean, roughly. Yeah. Ah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, and so yeah, okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, so they are Boolean gates. Uh, I mean, they're propositional gates, but n cubed is the number of gates. That, that's what I mean. So I'm restricting the, the, class, the concept classes, circuits with n inputs. So I'm looking at circuits with n inputs. Some gates here, so it's a graph, and, and, but the, the, the point is those n cubed gates. So I'm, I'm restricting the size of the circuit. Well, I mean, um, how many such circuits are there, roughly? There's um, roughly two to, the, two to the poly n such circuits. Because, you know, how could I choose the cir circuit for every pair of gates? I have to choose whether they're connected, what, um, what, the, what the label of a gate is. Is it and or not? So there are two to the poly n gates, which tells me that the VC dimension should be polynomial in n, because uh, if, I want to, if, I, if I have a set and I want to realize every labeling by one of the concepts, well, I, for each concept, it's going to give me at most one labeling. So the, the number of, total number of labelings I can have is 2 to the poly n, so the size of this set can be any polynomial. Poly, so if S has size poly n, the number of different labelings is 2 to the poly, poly n. So in other words, for any, every finite concept class, its VC dimension is at most log of the size of the class. So there the VC dimension is only polynomial many, uh, poly in n. So there we saw 4, there it's 2k two, two plus 1. For half spaces, the VC dimension, let me just say, is, is n plus 1. So given n plus 1 points in Rn, I can shatter. Well, there is a set of n plus 1 points that can be shattered by half spaces. And then you, if you look at these geometric examples, you have some idea that the VC dimension roughly corresponds to the number of parameters that's used to define a concept. So, um, uh, so how many parameters do I need to define an axis-aligned rectangle? I need to define the two corners, so I need four parameters. So uh, to define, say, a triangle, the parameters I need, well, I need six, I guess, for the three. Um, uh, um, uh, well, I guess I, I yeah, uh, six, let's say, for the three um, uh, vertices. A half space, n plus one parameters. But the outlier is going to be this guy here, uh, so this has VC dimension infinity. So what is this concept class? So it's parameterized, well, it's, it's a class of functions with this parameter. And the function looks at, um, well, the sign. Sign means if the thing is positive, return plus 1. The SGN, sign, is, and if the thing is negative, return minus 1. So here's a kind of, um, uh, here's a, so here's, let's say, I want to shatter this set here. So I've got a set of points I want to shatter, and I want to realize every labeling. So here's a labeling. And what I can do to realize this labeling is if, if my sign somehow behaves like this. So this is sine alpha x for some alpha. Then I've realized that labeling. So if I take the sign... So when sine is, is negative, I get minus. When sine is positive, I get plus. When sine is negative, I get minus. So the labeling here is the, the VC dimension here is infinity. And somehow there's a nice connection with logic here in that um, uh, essentially uh, if you're working with kind of so-called tame functions, the VC dimension of the, the, the class of space corresponds to the number of parameters that you use to define a concept. 
So here there's only one parameter, and the VC dimension is infinity, but it's because sine is not a nice function. So, um, uh, so I'll, I'll speak about this um, in, in the second half, but essentially, uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll, speak, uh, I'll speak about it more later. So in particular, we're going to see that um, this class here is not, this is going to be our first uh, example of, of, of well, uh, this is going to be a, 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 a concept class which is not packed learnable. So another concept class which is not packed learnable is going to be the class of all uh, k-gons in the plane, so where I've no bound on, on k. So all convex polygons in the plane is not, it's, going to, it's going to be not packed learnable. So, um, okay, so I, I want to just... So uh, this is... Uh, Radon's theorem is why the dimension of half spaces is n plus 1, but I'm going to jump over that. Um, so let me look how I'm doing for time. Uh, I'm a little bit behind. So I'm going <laughs> to jump over this uh, um, uh, uh, example. I want to talk about uh, dual classes. So uh, I have a, a concept class, C, Okay, so here's my concept class. And I, I'm going to define the dual class. So, well, let me just refer to the slide. So the dual class C star is a class of functions from C to 0, 1. So now that it's like the input space of this is now concepts of the, the previous space. And it's going to consist of all functions from C to 0, 1 um, indexed by uh, elements X of the original concept class such that fx of c is, c is c of x. And the claim is as follows. The vc dimension of um, c is less than or equal to the vc dimension of... Um, uh, I think I, I actually wanted to say the other. I mean, it somehow... I wanted to state it as this way. Okay. So here's the proof. Um, suppose that I could shatter so um, some set of guys in C of size two to the n for some n. Uh, let me call them C's, yeah. Suppose I could shatter these, uh, these. then in, uh, uh, in the, these guys are in the, uh, the um, uh, C, by guys in the dual class, then in particular um, there exists, so There exists xi such that uh, f xi cj equals 1 if ith bit of j is 1. So to say I can shatter this means that I can realize every labeling. So a labeling that I might want to realize is I want the labeling that says um, uh, take cj and map it to 1 if and only if the ith bit of j is 1. So that labeling is realized by this function. But then in this case, if I look at the set x1 up to xn, so by construction these xi are in x, then this, this set is shattered. So in fact, this set here uh, uh, in, in X is shattered by these functions C1 up to C2n. So uh, every so, for instance, if I have some labeling of this, then some labeling of this set will determine uh, an n-bit Boolean number, and the uh, say J and CJ will realize that um, that labeling. Um, so uh, we have this uh, uh, upper bound. So. In other words, uh, a concept class C is pack learnable if and only if its dual class is pack learnable. And we're going to use this um, uh, result, uh, well, 
uh, in this, this, this kind of approach to this little, little stone Walmouth conjecture. Okay, so... Um, Yeah, so this, there is this notion of VC dimension, and what we're heading towards is a result that says that a class, a concept class C is pack learnable if and only if it has finite VC dimensions. So this is kind of classical result. And the way we're going to... So why is VC dimension so useful? Uh, it controls the so-called... Uh, it's a way to get a bound on the so-called growth function of a concept class. So... Um, so consider a concept class C on an input space X, and uh, given a finite sample uh, S, points drawn from X, define the pi C of S to be, uh, well, the following thing, the set of uh, restrictions of concepts to, 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 um, to S. So the way to visualize this is you've got, a, you've got a set of points S, and what is pi C of S? So I've got a set of points S. And I've got some concept class in the background, C. So it's clear that if I pick a, a concept in C, uh, C and C, that induces a labeling on this set. Another concept will induce another labeling. And the question is, how many labelings are there? Well, it depends on the set. It depends on the concept class. But pi C of S gives me the set of all labelings. So how many ways are there for me to label that set? And the growth function is defined by... So it's a function from n to n. It takes an integer m. So it's, a, it, it's determined by the concept class. And the, the notation is pi. So pi for partitions. And it's the maximum over all subsets of the input space of size m of the number of labelings that I can... of, of such a set S. So here's a question. How can I reformulate that uh, a set is shattered in terms of, of, of this? So when is, when is a set shattered? What, what does this tell me about pi C of S, that S is shattered? Yeah, so a set S is shattered if I can realize all labelings. And this is shattered if the size of this, well, if S has size M, this is 2 to the M. So in particular, if I can find a set of every size that's shattered, then I know exactly what this function is. It's just the function m maps to 2 to the m. So if I'm in a concept class, let's say, uh, uh, where the VC dimension is infinite, so there are every, for every finite set, so every finite m, there's a set of size m that's shattered, then that tells me what the growth function is. Uh, OK, well, there's a, an exercise in a second, but... Um, uh, let me just go back in a second. But a key thing linking the VC dimension to the growth function is as follows. Let C be a hypothesis set with finite VC dimension D. Then for all M, this is going to be the size of the sets that I, I'm going to draw, I have the following bound on the growth function. And the thing to focus on, well, uh, this expression here, so in particular, this is going to be polynomial in, in, in uh, uh, M. So this is going to be a polynomial uh, with degree uh, D. So this is going to be um, O of M to the D, the growth function. Um, so there, there's a dichotomy. Either the growth function is exponential or it's polynomial. And it's polynomial when the, the, the VC dimension is finite. And it's very... So this, this, this expression here is very easy to remember. So... What is the prototypical example of a concept class that has VC dimension D, as in the statement of the theorem? So let's take the input space to be the natural numbers and see the collection of all subsets of N of cardinality at most D. So I should just say, uh, I hope it's very clear that I'm variously talking about concepts as functions to, uh, concept classes as classes of functions from 1, 0, and as classes of sets. The same, I mean, making this identification. So this, this clearly has uh, VC dimension D, the class of all subsets of cardinality at most D. So this is clear. And it's clear that the number of labelings using this concept class of a set of size M is just this. So it's just the number of subsets of size D. So what this is saying is, well, this um, upper bound on the growth function is in fact... Uh, I mean, this is the worst case for the growth function among, among VC, uh, classes of VC dimension D. So, okay, so now for a kind of workout, 
Um, let C be the class of annular disks like this. What is the growth function? Like, like can you work it out natively without, without looking, thinking about the VC dimension? So the, the concepts look like this. So here's R2. And the question is, given, given a sample, how many labelings uh, are there as a function of the number of, of points in the sample? So I can have, here's a sample here. And with this concept that I've drawn here, here's the labelling. And this is a sample of, of M points. And the question is, how does, what's the upper bound so pi of this concept class Cm is the number of labelings for a sample of size m. Uh, uh, so again, um, uh, what's, what's the kind of order of growth of this, this function here? So, I mean, there's clearly there are some, in this sample, there are clearly some labelings that are not achievable, so I'm not... Uh, I, I, I can't achieve all, it's not going to be 2 to the n. This is kind of clearly finite VC dimension. So let me... So there's a fixed, a fixed set here. Yeah? Sorry? Um, you, uh, well... Not, uh, at least not how I was thinking about it. I was thinking, well, maybe is there any, anyone else want to? So, I mean, what, what determines a labeling? So if I label this guy positively, so this, this just to be clear, these, um, these, these circles have centered the origin. So here's my, here's my class here. If I, I look at the radius of the points, uh, I look at the most, the point that's furthest, away, so the, the whole labeling is determined by two points, namely, the, 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 the positive point which is, has greatest radius and the positive point that has least radius. Or maybe it's only determined by one point. So the labeling is determined by either two points, if it's, um, uh, if it's like a fat annulus, or maybe one point, if it's a thin annulus that just contains one positive point, or maybe no points if it's the empty set. So, uh, for, well, it depends on the set, but... Uh, if for any kind of reasonable set in general position, um, this should be the number of um, uh, dichotomies that I can uh, realize. Okay, so, um, yeah, okay, so I guess I just continue for another five, five or ten minutes before a break. Uh, so there was Sauer's lemma. So this is the connection of VC dimension and the growth function. So, um, uh, so we introduced neural networks, and we have an idea that the VC dimension should correspond to the number of parameters. And there's a very precise formulation of that in model theory that we'll, uh, I'll, I'll just state it in the second half. Um, so, uh, so let's fix an architecture of a neural net. And the architecture of the neural net is just a graph. So just to, to reiterate this, um, so maybe I didn't make it... So why do I keep on moving the pens around? Um, where did I put them? Um, the so a fixed architecture of a neural net is just a directed graph where we've got these input nodes where we're feeding inputs. Um, so our inputs, let's say, come from R to the um, N0. So this is the... We've got N0 inputs, and we've got these internal so-called hidden layers. And so this is going to be a so-called fully connected neural net. So at each node, it's going to take in inputs. It's going to have weights at W1, W2, W3, W4, W5. And these weights are, are, are what I'm going to use to train the network. And then the output here is, is, is got by taking a weighted sum of the inputs and then applying the activation function and then feeding the output to the succeeding layers. And then, and then so on until uh, the output. And I'm assuming everything here is 0, 1. So the activation function here is always the step function. And so if I fix a graph, then I have a concept class. The concept class is got by varying the parameters of the net. So these weights in the graph. So this is what I mean by fixed architecture. 
And in this case, so um, uh, n0 is the number of inputs. So this is a concept class that takes uh, uh, tuples with a dimension n0s so to these, uh, uh, whoops, n0, not n0, and it maps something in 0, 1. So the uh, VC dimension here uh, is uh, at most the number of parameters. Uh, it's, it's linear in, in the number of parameters and the log of the number of parameters. And in fact, that's easy to show just knowing what we, uh, um, uh, knowing what we know. Um, so I'm going to, so essentially, the way, the way you can do this is you, well, you say, well, how, how do you prove this? Um, so this is for the, for the step activation, which I didn't say this. Yeah, so, um, well, I say it in the title of the slide with step activation. So this is a composition of perceptrons. We know the VC dimension of a linear classifier. Therefore, we have a bound on the growth function. Using a bound on the growth function for every layer, you can kind of trivially get a bound on the growth function for the whole thing. From the bound on the growth function, you get a bound on the VC dimension. So just by kind of um, simple manipulations, you can, you can prove this result. But the basic idea is that the number of parameters corresponds to the number of VC dimensions. And when, when we talk about sample compression schemes, there's a very general result that um, uh, makes that clear. So I, I'm just going to, to round off the first half by now making a connection with logic. Uh, so this is the learning and logic um, uh, uh, um, workshop. So um, we've seen a bunch of concept classes. So I said uh, rectangles in the plane, linear classifiers, polygons in the plane, neural nets, and there's a, a with a fixed uh, architecture. And there's a very general way that we can capture these concept classes in logic. So um, let's consider a signature sigma, predicate logic. So let's say first order signature. And let's take a formula where the variables are partitioned into two groups. So there are variables x1 up to xm and y1 up to yn. And uh, let's fix a sigma structure and uh, a set of elements b1 up to bn that we're going to instantiate the y variables with. And then what I'm going to define now is a class of sets. So the notation I'm using is um, this notation here. So the notation takes the, the, the structure and the, the, these, these, these uh, elements b1 to bn. I'll call these parameters. So what this is is a set of um, uh, a1 up to am tuples in the universe such that uh, a satisfies this. So here's the picture. We've got a formula. And it's going to define a concept class. Each concept is specified by the tuple of parameters b1 up to, to bm. So for every setting of parameters, I get a concept, which is this set. So as I say, a concept you can think of as a function. Um, so let me just say here that the input space here is am, where a is the, the universe of the, of the structure. So this is the input space. A, con a concept is a function from this to 0, 1, or equivalently a subset of this. And so this is a, a general way to define a concept class. And if you think that a, a lot of the concept classes we've been defining have this form, so rectangles in the plane, what are the parameters? They're the corners of the rectangle. And then there's the formula that tells us whether uh, uh, a, a tuple, a1, a2, is inside the rectangle. There's a single formula that does that. So the idea is that we have a single formula, and by varying the parameters, we get different concepts. So again, linear classifiers, what are the, the parameters? They're the, the coefficients of the linear function that defines the classifier. Even a neural net with a fixed graph can easily be, um, be put in this framework. We can have a, a fixed formula. The parameters are the weights of the neural net. Of course, the signature I need and the structure I'm working on depends on the type of neural net I have. So if I have like a, a sigmoidal activation function in my new neural net, so what structure am I working over? Well, I'm working over, uh, whoops, the structure. If, if my structure A is the reals with 0, 1, times, plus, and exponential, then for a fixed neural network, I can define, uh, for a fixed architecture, I can define a formula that defines the concept class determined by that architecture. It's 
So again, the parameters of the formula are the weights of the neural net, and, um, uh, and the formula classifies tuples. And, you know, so if the structure is nice enough, the, 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 the concept class, if the formula is nice enough or the structure is nice enough, the concept class will uh, have nice properties. So, um, so we will, we'll, we'll, we'll use this notation. So this is a concept class that's determined by a structure and a formula. And uh, again, so for every set of parameters, uh, we have a concept, which is this, which is a collection of subsets of, of a, a to the n. OK. And uh, do I have anything to say for that? Yeah, just some notation. We'll write VC phi of A for the VC dimension of this concept class. And what I kind of want to do in the, the second half is talk about um, various ways of, of bounding this and then connections with sample compression. Uh, yeah, so I, I want to consider structures like the reals, but also, find, also kind of graphs you know, um, uh, uh, discrete structures.